thank you, and, and thank you for coming out on a Saturday night. Um, I'm going to do this, I've been going around the country, been going around the country talking about this book in different venues, and uh, I've learned there are certain questions that people have, so I'm going to start in a place that is a little unusual for me. And it, uh, it goes like this. Um, I assume you know that we don't have an economic problem in the United States. <laughs> we really don't. The current economy produces $200,000 for every family of four. We have a, it's a very rich economy for all of its faults. We have a political problem managing the richest economy in the history of the world. And I'm going to talk about the possibility of a transition to change the system now that's the second point that I find people have trouble with. Most people know in some deep place that we're facing a systemic crisis and that you've got to change the system if you wanted to get anywhere near a decent society. People have a hunch about that. But my experience is most people don't believe that's possible. In fact, they, they have a vested interest, or we all have a vested interest in, in believing that's not possible. Uh, because if it is possible, and you care about these things, we've got to do a lot of work. So pessimism has its own rewards. You, you get to sit back, why bother? Nothing matters anyway. So um, the argument of this book is that, a, that we face a systemic crisis, and more challenging than that, that it may be possible over time to transcend and change the system. Now, I am a realist. I ran House and Senate staffs. I've been involved in real politics. I'm a historian and a political economist. So I don't say it lightly, but that is the argument. And furthermore, and here's where it gets even more interesting from the perspective of a historian, political economist, and maybe some of you folks care about these things. The argument is that given the extraordinary wealth of the system, and it will be very, very wealthy, it may be possible to build a system that transcends the limits of the traditional systems that we know about. So if you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what is it you want? And might there be a better alternative that is a system and, we, and an alternative that maybe we can get to? So in the 60s, that was called a heavy rap. That is to say, it opens up very, very challenging questions because most people really don't in, down in their hearts don't believe that's possible. So another way to get at this, and by way of introduction in, in a different place, uh, the way to begin to think about this in terms of process is to imagine those farmers, mostly farmers, and few small business people, mostly small businessmen, not women, who in the, in the late part of the 18th century thought they could take on the British Empire. And we obviously a ridiculous idea at that time, most powerful empire in the history of the world, perhaps at least at that point, and in fact somehow a combination of conditions that limited the power of the empire, there was a war with France, and determination and anger and pain actually permitted over time, decade by decade, a transcendent revolution. That did happen. Or imagine, many of you, some of the older women perhaps in the audience will remember, some of the things in the 1940s or at least your mothers would talk about, that women could not do. They couldn't have banking accounts. They, couldn't get, they had to get their husband to sign if they wanted to buy a house or a car. Uh, you couldn't get a, a job equal to a man's, um, et cetera, et cetera. And somehow, I mean, it would have been impossible to imagine that. And somehow, over time, there was a transcendence. Or more interestingly, but, and the point here is to look at time, not instantaneous? What are processes that go over time that might actually achieve power sufficient to alter fundamental conditions? Uh, more interesting, if you want to think about people who faced even more challenging difficulties and over time changed the system they were involved in, think about people, and these are my heroes by the way, civil rights workers in Mississippi in the 1930s and 40s. That's when the hard work was done laying foundations, hard work and danger, many were killed, many were tortured, laying foundations for what seemed impossible and became the explosion of the civil rights movement. So I want to give you the sense that when I say that a revolution is possible, I mean
step-by-step -step foundations may be being laid over the coming decades for something beyond which may catalyze in explosive qualities, but much more important is what's being built over time. And secondly, the pain levels that are driving that. So that's the context in which I'm kind of approaching this, and that's what the book's about. So the first thing to say about the actual argument of the book, and it is this argument that we face a systemic crisis, not a political crisis. It's not about the Tea Party. And it's not about the Republicans block blocking things in the House. Certainly those are problems. But the, you, can, you can tell it is a systemic problem, and the test is very easy, when you have long, 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 long trends of decay, irrespective of what happens in politics day by day, irrespective of what the Supreme Court does, and irrespective of the Tea Party. So for instance, over 30 years, the top 1% has taken literally all of the gains of the economic system to itself. It has gone from 20% of the income to 22 or 23 or 24, depends what year you measure. That means the bottom 99 lost all of that. That's a long 30-year trend, at least 30-year trend, that tells you there's something deeper in the system that's driving that. So if you look at CO2 production, Again, since, since 1970, steady increase, 30% of CO2 increase, irrespective of attempts to control, and what, virtually all of them have failed. Or if you look at a, a measure of liberty, and I find this one particularly interesting because people talk about liberty in terms of what the Supreme Court does and the law and interpretations and the judges. But liberty, the best single test of liberty is how many people are deprived of it and put in prison. The United States has had a steady increase from about 93 per 100,000 up to about 750 per 100,000 over 30 years in prison. We have eight times as many per capita in prison than any other advanced system, including Russia. So if you're looking at liberty, equality, I've talked about equality, liberty, ecological issues, on almost every major indicator, what you find are long, long trends that tell you that something deeper in the bowels of the system is driving this, irrespective of the Tea Party, who gets elected, etc. Now, there are exceptions. We can come to those in the question and discussion period, if you like. But the big picture is that's what's been going on and is likely to continue to go on unless something changes. Now, one way to ask the question, what is a systemic crisis in the United States? And this is major, the second argument of the book. And a second argument that is very difficult, particularly for uh, liberals to understand. Now, I come out of liberalism. I'm a Wisconsin progressive liberal. At least that's where I came from. I, w I ran House and Senate staffs for liberal Wisconsin senators and, and congressmen. It's Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, I was his legislative director. So I come out of the tradition I'm going to talk a little bit about and think is dying and almost in, and decaying before your eyes. The systemic design, let me use that word, the systemic design that we have lived with for a long time is the corporations are allowed to control the capital and we attempt to countervail John Kenneth Galbraith's term. We try to regulate, we try to tax, we try to spend for good things, we try to allocate resources that way. And that is the model that we've had. Let them have the capital and try to constrain them. In Europe, they call it social democracy. Here, it's called liberalism. At the core of that systemic design has been another institution besides the corporation. And that institution was organized labor in unions with money and muscle as institutions, not just movements. And one of the reasons those trends are, being, are going in the direction they're going, probably the most important single reason, is that labor has declined from 33.5% of the labor force being in unions in 1953, just after World War II, down now to, to the 11% range and 66 in the private sector and decaying. So the whole model, which was kept sort of in line by a design that had some institutions with great power and some attempting to countervail or keep them in line, that model is decaying before your eyes.
And that is probably the most important single reason the trends that you see are going in the direction you see. Now, I should be disturbing you with that, because that, if you understand that argument, the whole structure that we have been living with is in radical decay. And there's no obvious way out of the box. Furthermore, most people don't have any idea of what it would be if you got out of the box. If you don't like corporate capitalism, and most people don't like state socialism, what is it that might make sense if that design is gone? Do you understand how challenging the question really is? If you take it very seriously, what in the world, you know, Margaret Thatcher had the famous line, Tina, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative, was her argument. It's only capitalism, once, once the state Soviet Union collapsed. So that's a serious argument. If you were to go in a new direction, where is it you want to go? Now, I think there's an answer to that question, or I wouldn't have written this book. But, and I think people are beginning to move in the direction of an answer and building towards an answer. But I think it, it, it's, a, it's a very serious question that anyone serious about politics needs to contend with if the arguments I've suggested are right, if we are in a systemic crisis. So briefly, systems logically, for the most part, revolve around who's got the wealth. In feudalism, the lords, the church, and the landed gentry and the king all had the wealth, and they had the power. In 19th century capitalism, small businessmen mostly had the power, had the wealth. And most of the small businessmen, and they were men, were farmers. They were not peasant farmers. They were capitalist farmers in the marketplace, small businessmen. They sold their grain in the marketplace. And they, when the market went up and down, they went up and down. Very different from European structure. And there was a sort of populist quality to that, uh, or at least something like it, but very different from corporate capitalism. Corporate capitalism, the corporations have the, power, have, the, have the capital, and by and large, at the end of the 19th century and for a good part of the early part of the 20th century, they ran the game un unimpeded by labor and labor's allies. And obviously, I'm oversimplifying just to sketch these things. That system, corporation owning the capital, by the way, can come in different flavors, if you like. One is simply corporate capitalism without labor unions as in the beginning part of the 20th century, great power. Or the model that is decaying, liberalism, corporations, and kind of balanced by labor and the social democratic policies. Or the other third model, well-known model of corporate capitalism is fascism. Corporations have the power, but with authoritarian rule, as in Latin America, as in Germany during, and, and Italy during the second, second part of the second three decades of the century. So the question becomes, is there a way beyond that? And if you don't like state socialism, is there any other place to put the capital? If systems revolve significantly about who controls capital, not entirely, there are cultural and other factors, but if the control of capital yields great power, and if you have a system design that doesn't deal with who gets to control the capital, you probably don't have a systemic design that will last. So that's the challenge. And if it isn't in the state, and if it's not in the corporations, and it's not in the landed lords, where else might capital be built up in a system that would be democratic, perhaps ecologically sustainable, perhaps concerned with community, and perhaps concerned with the well-being of a larger majority? Well, it turns out there are traditions that have asked that question. Moreover, there are experiments in a lot of them Moreover, in the United States, there's a lot going on which begins to suggest a different direction and maybe even a systemic design. So the first, the first argument becomes, if you put it in the state, it concentrates power. But maybe there are other places that, in fact, people can put capital in ways that decentralize power. So that's an opening question. That's not an answer. That's an opening question for your systemic design. And maybe, and here's the second are part of the argument, there may be pathways forced by the pain of the failing system. Let me say that again. There may be pathways forced by the pain of the decaying system that allow the transcending slow development of alternative places to build up capital in a democratic form that is decentralized and changes power relationships 
at the same time as it opens up new vistas and new visions? Maybe. So how do you even begin to get a handle on what that might look like, particularly in the United States? Well, one way is to begin looking around the country, and we do a lot of research on this at, at the University of Maryland and in the Democracy Collaborative, for alternative structures that democratize the ownership of wealth and that are expanding. That's a starting place. That's not an answer. That's a starting place. And some of them are old structures which are undergoing kind of transformation and renewal, and some of them are new ones. So what do I mean? The most obvious one is the garden variety co-op. One person, one vote, ownership of wealth. There are 130 million Americans who are members of co-ops and co-ops and credit unions, which is also a co-op form. That's 40% of the society. Very interesting. And the credit unions themselves, been there a long time, standing there, kind of an ordinary, mundane institution. Taken together, they have more capital than any one of the giant five big New York banks. And what's happening in a number of the credit unions is there is a process. People have realized they're one person, one vote. That means you can go to the annual meeting as a member. In fact, you can join. And if you go to the annual meeting, you'll find that in this boring institution that's been giving loans for cars and houses, nobody comes to the meeting because nobody cares. But some people in several parts of the country are electing new members to the board and asking that they use the power of all that capital for some more creative things. So it's a very interesting kind of little sliver of an idea. There it exists, huge amount of wealth, huge capital, and decentralized in its structure. There's another place. Most people don't know there are 11 million Americans who are members of worker-owned companies. That's, that's about 3 million more than are members of, work, of unions in the private sector. The press, by the way, doesn't cover any of this. It's, it's very important. They can't, they don't have the money, and they don't have the interest, they don't have the reporting staffs. So you have to really dig to find out these, obvious, these things that are pretty obvious if you look at them. There are 11 million people in worker-owned companies. Another illustration, suggestive, not definitive, suggestive of a different way to organize the ownership of wealth and capital institutionally, that might be another place to look for building up something more in the direction of a new system. You probably didn't realize, and I didn't until I studied it and began digging, doing the research for this book, that 25% of American electri electricity is generated by socialist institutions. I mean really socialist institutions. City-owned utilities and co-ops. And there they exist all around the country. And many of them are beginning to take on new forms. For instance, they're getting into internet development, they're doing green projects, they're becoming oriented to trying to tra transform different parts of the local economy. And that institution has power which is yet, not yet tapped. And there it is, another form of ownership that is decentralized and gives you another ingredient to begin thinking about as possibly building up. There are many, many more of these. The book co covers different sectors. Social enterprise, another form. Now, there are a whole lot of folks involved in social enterprise. There is one called Credo. How many folks use Credo? Uh, uh, Credo is, came out of working assets. It's a company set up and makes a lot of money. It's set up to make money and use it for social and political purposes. And there are several thousand of those around the country that you don't find written about. But again, changing ownership for a political and social purpose. That's another example. The neighborhood corporations are out there as well. There are about 5,000 of them in the country. Some boring, some interesting, and some getting very interesting indeed to developing large-scale ownership. There's one in New Jersey that has 1,400 employees very large owner and owns land and stores and so by a neighborhood structure. Another piece of the puzzle, so I'm throwing out lots of illustrations because the book is filled with things that, by the way, you can do here. <laughs> uh, that's a uh, sidebar. What we're finding is people don't know about what's happening in the next city and don't know about it and they think it's impossible actually when you actually give information has power sometimes and I'll tell you a couple stories about that. So land ownership is another piece of the puzzle. Let me, land is the critical one in city development. And these are, um, if you like, pebbles and ingredients for something that might be taken and built using these pebbles and ingredients of actual real experience 
that suggests decentralized ways to own capital. And they are all growing. That's the interesting part of this. And they're growing largely because of pain and difficulty and no answer out of the political and economic system. So you're seeing people resorting to this kind of effort because they're not getting answers out of the political system and because social and economic pain is growing. Let me give you another one on land trusts. How many know what a land trust is? You draw a circle around several acres or whatever size you want. You socialize it, either through a nonprofit corporation that has a public purpose or by city government. Now, 35 years ago, you couldn't find any land trusts in the United States. There were two that started up by people who were veterans of the civil rights movement, Bob Swan in Vermont and the Sherrods in Georgia. And they, drew, they socialized the land. They put a nonprofit corporation in order to control land inflation and also to preserve the land in a different way. And it was a very interesting idea that everyone thought was a silly idea, kind of marginal. There are hundreds and hundreds of land trusts now around the country, some of them very large. In Irvine, California, the 5,000 units of housing in land trusts. What it means is that if you put the land under public or quasi-public or nonprofit ownership, you can control the gentrification process. So instead of prices going up and the poor kicked out, some part of it can be allowed to go up and you cross-subsidize you cross the other parts. So that's a way of socializing land and capturing the surpluses and pouring them back in for other purposes, not attempting the tax route, which is controlled by the developers. Do you understand the model? If you change the ownership structure, you control the surplus and you can use it for public purpose. So let me give you another illustration that the press doesn't cover. It used to be, I'll stop giving you illustrations after a while, but I just want you to get the feel of what's out there because it, this, is, this is the nitty gritty of the kind of slow, quiet things that the press isn't covering. In most cities, if, you, if the city government and the taxpayers put a big investment in for subways and mass transit, at every exit, the values of the land will go up. Why? Because there's a lot of people there, stores make money there, housing is great there. So the public investment creates land values that the developers capture. That's the typical way it's run. Not anymore. Most cities now socialize the land and then lease it to the developer instead of trying to tax it back. Please, can I, would you please possibly give us a little tax money? No, take it over by city ownership of the land at the exits. Then the public investment creates surpluses which are directly taken by the city by leasing the land at whatever the price will be and, and using the surplus for taxpayers. These are all micro forms of changing ownership and they are all growing partly by virtue of the tax crisis, partly by virtue of pain, and partly by virtue of development. Probably the most important part of this, a lot of young people are getting involved in this. Everywhere I've gone you find people trying to build new co-ops getting very sophisticated about co-op development, land trust development, agriculture, a lot of it's green, and they're beginning to take into their own hands the redesign of this kind of effort. Most interesting part of this is when you see, if you stand back as a historian and look at some of the processes at work in a historical perspective. I've just been giving you illustrations. So let me give you another way to come at this. I'm gonna come at it six or seven different ways and then kind of try to draw a little ring, or put a little ribbon on it and talk about it in a different way. Um, I was involved with the Youngstown steel, steel collapse in 1977. How many know about that? Some old hands. Okay, Youngstown was a very, very big deal. 5,000 steel workers lost their jobs in one day, 1977, and it was national news. The reason it was national news, it hadn't happened before. It happens all the time now, so it isn't national news. And besides, the press isn't interested. What was interesting about it was the steel workers and the local religious leaders saw what would happen to that town if the steel mill went down. It would take a good part of the town with it. And so they got the crazy idea that why shouldn't we set up a worker community owned mill? Take it over, refurbish it, and put it back to work under that kind of ownership structure. Crazy idea. But they did their politics and they, got the, they organized and they got the Carter administration at that time to finance a very sophisticated study of, of how you could actually do it by the top, top experts in the steel industry. And then they forced the Carter administration to pledge $200 million in loan guarantees. This is in 1977. 
multiply, multiply that by five and you get some idea of how big they were, how big the numbers really would be today. And the Carter administration did make that pledge. After the election of 1978, the money kind of went away. But they knew it might. They were serious political people. And so their second, their fallback plan B that they knew about was to try to educate throughout the state and throughout the country that this was an idea whose time has got to come. And they thought we may lose the battle, but maybe we'll win the war if we can, if we look at it in the way I suggest the 30 year trends of the women's movement in the Mississippi and thinking about long trends. Well, in Ohio today, you'll find more worker owned companies per capita probably than any other state because of that work. And furthermore, there's been evolution, and this is the concept to get clear on. Out of the pain and difficulty, because there aren't any other answers and no jobs, Ohio looks, a lot of the country looks like Ohio has looked for the last 30 years. The Rust Belt states went first. Out of that pain, there's also been innovation and sophistication and further development, not just numbers. So in Cleveland today, you will find a complex of large-scale worker-owned companies linked together by a revolving fund and linked together also by a nonprofit corporation so that they make money to help rebuild the community as well as with the revolving fund keep starting new, new, new worker-owned companies. So what I mean, they're really significant companies. They just opened about two and a half months ago the largest urban greenhouse in the United States. It has a capacity, it's, a, it's a, a hydroponic, it has the capacity to produce three million heads of lettuce a year. It's very large scale. I learned, this kind of blew me away, to do that you have to plant 26,000 heads of lettuce every day. So these are not small operations. They have a very large scale um, greenhouse, industrial scale greenhouse to serve laundry to the, uh, to the hospitals in the area. And also there's a solar installation company online to put in just about double the amount of solar that exists in Ohio. And the idea is to keep building a complex that builds the community. And they're not freestanding worker-owned companies. They're linked together to build the community. They can't run off. And that's the idea. So notice you've got an increase in scale and innovation. And now it's a community building structure. Some of you know about Mondragon in the Basque country of Spain. This is built in part on Mondragon, but the community structure is even more innovative. So the thing to look at there is over 30 years, not only growth in numbers, but growth in sophistication. And furthermore, very interesting, they're in the middle, every city's got this, in the middle of this very poor neighborhood, 40,000 people, mostly black, 40% unemployment, 40% unemployment, 18, average family income, 18,000, this is what is happening. In the middle, there are big hospitals and universities. Case Western Reserve, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, right in the middle of that. And that's true of many places. They're called anchor institutions. They are anchored. They can't get up and go like major corporations who come into a community and then go after they take the tax benefits. They're, they're there. You have them too. In that particular neighborhood, and this is part of the evolution, they purchase three billion, with a B, dollars in goods and services a year. That's leaving, plus their salaries, and plus their construction, just what they buy. None of it until recently from that area. And a good part of it is financed by taxpayers. Educational money, Medicare, Medicaid, it's all flowing into those hospitals and universities. So the light bulb has gone on, and this is another part of the evolution to get them to purchase from community building structures that are worker owned, and the revolution will come. <laughs> <laughs> community building structures that are worker owned, but also sophisticated in that they're tapping into existing institutions and building out from that structure. It is somewhat of a planning system with a public market or quasi public market to stabilize a whole different structure of ownership. And it is, it is being supported by small businessmen as well as the poor community because it helps the entire community. Very interesting structural advance in sophistication. So the ball to keep your eye on here is not only numbers that you, the press doesn't cover, but evolution in design and complexity and sophistication in the design. And there's another piece of evolution that if you watch closely things the press doesn't cover, 
In the state of Ohio in 1977, the local steel workers, the ones who lost their jobs, were the ones who were innovating and really wanted to save that mill. That means they were activists. The international leadership didn't want to have more activists, and they opposed the local effort. In fact, probably, though we can't prove it, they probably went to Washington with the, with the corporations to cut down the steel, the, this local kind of hot young thing that was building up with a lot of energy, and it disappeared. Now that's the way it was in 1977. But there is now evolution there as well. The, the United Steel Workers' top nas national and international leadership is now leading the fight to have worker community-owned structures around the country. They are pushing now for ownership by workers. Big change in the, in the unions. Looking to, notice the model. The model is now moving towards an ownership model, democratizing ownership, a worker-owned company, rather than simply trying to regulate the corporations, because you do whatever you can on that front, begin shifting institutional power and make it more and more sophisticated. That's a whole track that's going on. There are three or four tracks like that that I cover in the book. The point of which is that pain levels and the absence of any realistic solution the old way are forcing people more and more to innovate and to realize they can innovate. And if the guys did it in Cleveland, why can't we do it here? That kind of thing's happening. And young people particularly beginning the light bulbs are going on saying, if they can do it, why can't we? And that is beginning to happen, particularly on this side, the work co-op movement is very, very intense. Two or three other tr tracks, and I'll do these rather quickly because, because of the time available. Um, there are other things going on in different parts of the system that are really attention to which must be paid. And they all end up with somehow democratizing ownership in decentralized ways. So for instance, how many know about the Bank of North Dakota? Yeah, there you go. People here know. All right. From North Dakota, probably. <laughs> From here, great. The uh, Bank of North Dakota is a socialist bank. The state-owned bank's been there since the early part of the, the 20th century. It's owned by the bank. The profits go to the taxpayers. It's supported by the farmers and the small businessmen, and there it is, sitting there. So something like 20 states have introduced legislation to have a bank like the Bank of North Dakota. And that's another movement that's building up, and I think will continue to build up. Still another piece of the puzzle, and this one may be even the most important one sitting there. The healthcare system is use, uses 18% of the GDP, almost a fifth of the economy, pretty much double what any other healthcare system uses. You know, most are in the 10, 11%, some less than that, and usually they, and they all have better outcomes. Ours uses far, is double the cost and, and, and the worst outcomes by far. And the cost structure is continuing. As the financial pressure continues, and it is getting worse in the healthcare system, and costs are getting worse, what you're, going to, what you're already seeing, and you're going to see more of, is the corporations are going to start taking the penalties and, and getting rid of the insurance. And people are going to be thrown off their, off their insurance. That's happening around the country. There's more and more pain is happening, and the cost structure is growing up. The, where, the, where the rubber hits the road is in the states. And state by state by state, we're beginning to see some 20 states have introduced legislation to have single payer in states. The furthest along is Vermont, which will have it in 2014. California passed it twice, and it was vetoed twice by the last governor. We'll see what happens with the new governor. So, so there is a, pro but there is a, the thing to watch here is not whether this is good guys and bad guys. There is a dynamic that's creating this. The pressures of costs in the healthcare system and the pain levels are forcing a possible transformation of the healthcare system, agonizing state by state by state over the coming decades. The, pro the things I've been talking about at the local level are being driven by pain levels and the absence of a solution, state by state by state. If you look at banking, that's another possibility at a very different level, and this is a third process. There are about four that I would outline for you. Most people who look at the banking system at the national level and the experts on this are left, right, and center, are almost unanimous in predicting another major financial crisis. Almost unanimous. Left, right, and center. The reason is the banks are too big to regulate. They control the action. And I worked in the House and Senate, and it means that lobbyists are everywhere, and they find ways to do very small changes which have huge implications, and they control that action.
The Attorney General of the United States, I don't know if you all saw this, about three weeks ago, testifying before Congress, asking why haven't you taken any of these people to court who, who, have, created, who have committed crimes? And he said, basically, they're too big to, to take to court. That means they can do whatever they want because the Attorney General isn't going to sue them. That whole system is very shaky. And there's a great deal of anger by the banks. I mean, the current Nostrum, and I say that delicately because I, I would like to see it happen, is break them up. Break up the big banks. Sherrod Brown's got legislation to produce that, and I think that's a good idea. But I don't have any illusions about it, and I don't think you should either. If you look at the history of AT&T, or if you look at Standard Oil, you break them up, and then the big fish eat the little fish, and you're back at the trough. The people who understood this best, and I think this is what will happen over the coming decades. Now notice what I'm doing, you guys. Notice what I'm doing. There's a great pain level. The system is not, not working because the old balances are gone. Pain is developing at the local level, all sorts of interesting things, decentralized ownership things. At the state level, interesting things going on with banking at the city level, land trusts, all kinds of odd things. The healthcare system has got another dynamic and it moves in the direction of single payer, which is another way to have public ownership of the system, piece by piece by piece at the state level. And the banking system is another part. That's a different level crisis, which be, because it may be national, may take a different track at the national level. It's the first time I've said anything about national. I'm talking about building over time from the bottom up so far. And again, because the old system can't solve problems. If you start thinking about that particular part of it, there's a whole different dynamic that looks like this. And the people who understood this best, I take my hat off to them, and you will be surprised, are the conservative economists of the Chicago School of Economics who were Milton Friedman's teachers. Now, why in the world would I say something like that to an audience like this, right? Because they were honest men. They were interested in a free market, small business economy that actually was a free market economy, rather than one that was rigged by the big corporations. They saw the big banks and the big corporations as destructive of what they wanted, which was a free market economy. And they were sophisticated about it. They said, well, if you try to regulate those guys, they will take over the regulators. They got Nobel Prizes for the argument. They made a very sophisticated argument. All right, that's the liberal nostrum. I used to do that when I worked in the House and Senate. You try to regulate them. That's how we're gonna do climate change, right? We're gonna try to regulate them. But they're powerful enough, too powerful, so they regulate the regulators. Swarms of lobbyists with a lot of money and a lot of lawyers and sitting down opposite young kids working like me, young kids working in the House and Senate and saying to them, you know, gosh, you're very smart. You know, I'm not trying to say anything to you, but you know, when, you, when you're done with this, there may be some other jobs. Pay three times as much for because you've got some experience. It's a really vicious game. But the problem is that it doesn't answer the problem, and the problem gets worse and worse. So the judgment that call there is that as that goes on, we're likely to see more and more crisis. And what the Chicago schools guys said, you also can't break them up. He said, if you, if you break them up, they'll regroup. It's obvious. Anybody who knows anything about institutional dynamics. So the Chicago school economists, Milton T. Friedman's teachers, and his most revered teacher, Henry C. Simon, the founder of the Chicago school, argued as follows. Well, to preserve a free market, since we can't regulate them, it won't work, and since we can't break them up, we have to turn them into public utilities. We have to socialize them. That's the only logical option. But they're right. Quite apart from good guys and bad guys, that's the only option available if you can't regulate and if you can't break them up. That's what's left. And I think that's where we're going to see, you know, we may go once or twice or three times down that road, but at some point the anger at the big banks, left, right, and center, I think is going to take us in that direction. Now remember, I'm a historian. I'm talking about the next decades, not the next week. But if the pain levels continue, and think about this part, and if people learn in their own experience something about how to democratize ownership, really, from land trusts, from local businesses, from local utilities, from just ordinary experience, that's the kind of thing that led to the prehistory of the New Deal, where the developments that became national at the New Deal time, 
were developed case by case by case in the states and localities until the moment came when they could have been applied nationally. And if there is no solution nationally, by the way, I'm not urging this. I'm suggesting this is a pattern. I would urge it, but there is an emerging pattern that cannot solve the problems. And somehow or another, the logic offers this option and probably only this option or the pain gets worse. One final of the three or four different tracks, one final track just to toss out to think about. And this is the point. If you look closely, in many, many areas, the same logic is emerging out of this pain and out of the failure of the system to regulate and manage itself. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we nationalized two of the big car companies a couple of years ago. We did do that. We nationalized big companies. And we nationalized and still own as a public resource AIG, the largest, the largest insurance company in the world. The Americans in this conservative country, country nationalizing companies, we in fact have done that and with the politics we now have, use taxpayer monies to give it back. It may well be in the next or the one beyond or the one beyond that crisis. At some point, if there's a buildup of real experience, some of those big ones will stay in the public realm and begin to be used to stabilize cities and build mass transit and vehicles and the sort of thing that you could do if you were intelligent about using those resources in a different way. <laughs> and if people had actually experienced in their own lives and in their own communities different ways to organize production, worker co-ops, the, the sort of models where you use quasi-public money. You know, if you think about it this way, if hospitals and universities have a lot of public money in it, and they stabilize worker-owned companies and stabilize the community, the day we have mass transit and high-speed rail companies at the national level, they could perform much larger forms of the same thing, stabilizing communities. Now, this is all obviously very utopian talk. You don't believe any of this stuff. <laughs> it's very hard to stand back and say, the pain levels, in fact, are systemically driven and are not going to go away. And therefore, people are being forced to do things that are very hard, not because they want to. What they would like is the old way back. But the agony and pain is the driver to look at. And if the logic of this, this discussion, the collapse of labor and the collapse of the liberal solution, that model is decaying, there either is no solution or it will be a solution that is built up agonizingly step by step over time over you want to play this game throw a few decades of your life on the table over time laying down knowledge experience foundation inspiration learning from one community to another that kind of hard historical work that's the way the women's movement built it that's the way the civil rights movement built it that's the way historical change occurs I don't think we are in the, mo in the stage of changing the system. I think we may be in the prehistory. Think about that. The prehistory of a great transformation. Now that happens to be the hardest place. That's like those Mississippi people 30 years ago. That's what the hard place where the real, really challenge. It's all very easy to join a movement when the movement's moving. You all been, some of you folks have been in civil rights and environmental. It's real easy once the movement's moving because there's a lot of excitement and energy. The place for the heroics is now. People willing to roll up their sleeves and begin to develop the models and say, if you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, there is a very, and this is the interesting part to me, a very, very American feel to this kind of stuff. It's very down home. It starts at the local level. This is not France. These are Americans who roll up their sleeves and kind of get to work locally. It has a really nice American cultural feel to it too, starting at the bottom, starting in communities and building community forward. Now, you know, the logic of, I'm a historian and political economist, so I'm going to end with this. The logic is like this. It is possible that nothing can change certainly possible that all the decay will continue and the pain will continue. Decay and decay, decay. Rome decayed. That's possible. It's possible that there will be decay and violence and with violence repression and a corporate state of some kind, maybe even something looking like 
fascism. That's possible. Don't, no illusions. On the other hand, look to Latin America. Those dictators who were there aren't there anymore. So that isn't the end of history necessarily, though it might be. They may last forever. It's possible that the kind of work that's happening may simply bolster the old liberalism, that these co-ops and different things I've talked about may give a little nudge and keep it in place and the system won't really progress, but it will not collapse and it'll be a little better. It would be an improvement. Well, we'll take an improvement. But it is also possible, speaking as a historian, and I ask you to think as a historian, it is also possible, as in many, many parts of the world, think of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, think of apartheid collapsing, think of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Revolutions are, and I exaggerate slightly, they're as common as grass in world history. And always they seem impossible. So one last, if I say one last word, don't believe me, but, <clears throat> but I will say one last word. So um, I'm kind of cool about this. I, I actually think we're in a process of many decade development, that, and it's a very exciting process if you see it with these kind of perspectives. If you see that's what then must we do is to further the process. That's what the book argues, that this is happening. But it's not intentional. It's not sophisticated. It isn't when intention and clarity and choice are added to emergent processes. You get a very different power dynamic. So let me say that again. This stuff is happening. It's not intentional yet. It's not part of a strategic decision of people to invest and go this direction yet. When that happens, something different happens. That's when movements begin to move. So I think we're even in the prehistory of a potentially great movement. That's really the interesting part of, of this sort of thing. I was going to say something in this last moment, but I think I'm going to sit down and leave it at that. Thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> Sir. Uh, you didn't mention anything about the war economy of the United States or the foreign policy, the destructive foreign policy of the US, I should say. Uh, I'm, my own quest in this direction started at that end, <clears throat> started with foreign policy questions. He mentioned the book about the atomic bomb, and I, that was a, began as a study of American imperialism and only found out about the bomb later. So, um, and one of the questions that, uh, at, the core, at the source of the in American imperial strategy is systems that must expand by virtue of their capitalist dynamic. There are other dynamics that expand. But the dri driving force of American imperialism was the source of going for markets, needing markets, needing resources, needing investment outlets, et cetera, in the late part of the 19th century. It's been well described historically. But systems that must expand tend to produce imperial relationships. They try to control the markets and the communities and so forth. So that's where I'm coming from originally. And what the kinds of systems, think about the model that's stabilized in Cleveland or stabilized by virtue of the car production, which is stable, it's not a market, it's a, it's a stable system, a quasi-public market. Those models are the kind of models that interest me for that fundamental reason. So that, but to answer your question more directly, I think the American empire is in great decay and is being forced back upon itself. And I think that on the whole is a good thing and I think we, we, can, we need to help that process along. But you know, interestingly, military spending is very large, but it has radically declined as a share of the economy over the last 50 years. It was 42% it was, oh, during World War II of the economy. It peaked at 14% in the Korean War, averaged 10% in the 1950s. In the P Vietnam War era, it, it peaked at 8.8%. It's now moving towards less than 3% of the economy. One of the, and great damage is being done. Great damage is being done. But two things. One, it means that you don't stimulate the economy domestically in the way that it's very large, but not large relative to the economy, which means that the pain levels are going to continue, forcing the large processes I've been talking about, contributing to the pain levels and the processes. On the other hand, and this is the hard part for most people, I think there's a lot we can do to, to change American foreign policy. But I don't think you get much change until you change the system. And when I worked in the State Department, we, what, we, what, what happened is very good people were trying to do things in the, kind of in the developing world and come up with a program. 
by the time it hit the ground, the corporations had turned it. And I don't think you're going to get much change until we change. So we can do what we can to try to limit constraint. But if you want to change American foreign policy, you've got to change the system because it is being generated from very deep sources within the system and, and largely corporate sources. So I, I'm, I'm kind of a hard liner on that. I think it's utopian to think we're going to change much in our foreign policy stance until we actually change who we are and our whole structure of corporate capitalism. Sir? Is there any hope that, um, that some of the libertarians, idealistic libertarians among the Tea Party people or other groups on the left, on the right, will, um, will actually do some good in, in getting rid of corruption? And um, can there be an, um, a cooperation between progressives and some of these libertarians to, to achieve like, end of militarism, but also economic, no, true economic reform? Yeah, I think they. Um the, the, the libertarians and the Tea Party people, that's a, the Tea Party is a very small and highly publicized group. Highly publicized, but very small. People with attitudes of the kind that are anti-corporate and anti-big government and anti-military are large. But they're not necessarily, they, they always get mushed together with, these are all Tea Party people. I think there is a base for kind of cooperation on many things that begin with a localist vision amongst those people. I'm from Racine, Wisconsin. That's a dying industrial town in the Midwest. And when I go back home and talk to my, ex my high school buddies, some of whom are very conservative, but also very smart, their openness and interest in a community building kind of vision that's practical is much, much more open than the kind of crazies you see on television. Uh, and in the Cleveland model, you see kind of local businessmen are helping try to set it up for worker ownership. They're trying to help this process, not, not thwart it. So yes, there are the Tea Party and the, they get a lot of press, but there's a, also a great deal more openness and I think and, and intelligence amongst some of these folks that the key part of this that I've experienced, we do a lot of work on this stuff in, in different communities. The really important thing is, does it make sense? Are these projects practical? Can you explain them or, or is it just a bunch of rhetoric? And if it is actually something that makes sense, you can explain it. <laughs> And if you can explain it and it makes sense, you'd be surprised how many people will listen because there's a lot of pain that they're feeling too. This is an answer. So lots of communities are experimenting with it, some very conservative ones. The stuff in Cleveland, by the way, there are about 10 communities trying to do the same thing uh, already, and about 100 have inquired about using the same power of the anchor institutions to build up worker ownership and stabilize the base that, in some very conservative communities, by the way. Sir. One of the things that happened historically in the 30s and in the 20s when those local experiments were starting up was that um, they were run by the kind of people you just talked about, the people that could talk to ordinary people, make the case, make it from a practical point of view, make it out of necessity, and you know, have a very sort of human, you know, Americans are great pragmatists. It's like, you know, right. here's the nuts and bolts, here's how it works. What I, frankly, and I say this as a progressive, what I frankly see among my fellow progressives is we have a tendency to not be able to do that well. We have our own specialized language. We have our own specialized way of talking. We are arrogant. We are not good at talking to people who are not leftists. Um, we are self-isolators. And we get into interesting arguments over nothing. And so there's that tendency. And, and anybody who's spent any time on the left in this country knows it. And so I'm sure you've seen that. And do you have anything to say about like <laughs> what we <laughs> well, two, th two things. One, one uh, the analogy is, also, is a very good point. That a lot of the things that became the New Deal were, in fact, cooked at the state and local level, and then the moment arrived, they went national. And it's a, that's kind of the process I'm describing here, right? uh, as, a, as a maybe process. The um, well, first, younger people, there's something else going on. Lo lots of younger people are much more uh, talking to each other in a different way. Uh, some of them get kind of weird, and, and but there are there are other people who are kind of um, open to a sense of community and trying to reach out to people. So I'm not so sure people our age, uh, are the, if the, we may learn something from other people. And yes, it's true. I, I think uh, parts of the progressive movement, parts of the left, are, don't want to talk to Americans. They, but it's a narrow circle. So that means we have to, uh, we have to clean up our act. <laughs> and that's the only way to say it, that is get out there and do it and, and stop that nonsense. Um, We'll see how it goes, but, but I think the next generation. Here's another number, which I, I should have mentioned because it's, it kind of it tickles people, but it tells you about where younger people are. Uh, have you seen the polls on the word socialism? Yes. 
the, the, there are three polls and, and, and one finding. The, fir the finding is that uh, when people under 30, the last three polls show more people slightly favor the term socialism rather than capitalism. Slightly favor, that, that, that's the poll data, which means that the, it doesn't have all that crazy stuff that we had in the McCarthy era and so forth. Uh, so that's number one. The other one is, the other, it's not a poll data, but it's a finding, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the online dictionary. The two most looked up words in the last year were socialism and capitalism as a pair. So it means young people are looking for different an answers. I think we've gone through a period where the left was so isolated by the triumph of the system, plus repression, but the system was triumphant and it, there seemed no way out. Um, the left's got a lot of learning to do, but I think there's a lot of learning from the people who are doing practical things on the ground that's forcing people to begin to think in a different way. Let us hope. <laughs> yes? Yep. If, if any at all? Well, that's really, it's very interesting because um, what I've suggested is that there are many, many places in the country, because of the failures of the system, we're experiencing buildups of non-reported democratization projects on many kinds changing the ownership of capital. Um, it, the, the academy, you know, the next question is, that isn't yet a system. That's not a systemic design. These are ingredients of what might become the elements of a systemic design that might preserve and build communities from the bottom up and stabilize. That whole, I take up sort of the sketch of that in the afterword of this book, where this might point. But there's a hell of a lot of important work to do on analyzing this, on, on learning from other countries, on thinking about the planning problems involved. That kind of work the academy could begin to turn to. And some people are slowly. For instance, there's a, a political science. It's, it's interesting things going on. The president of the American Political Science Association this year is a woman at Harvard named Jane Mansbridge. She's, her whole career is about how you build up democracy from the bottom up. And that's her, and she's the president, of the, the president of the American Sociological Association last year is a guy from Wisconsin, Eric Olin Wright, who has published an extraordinary book, which I recommend to you, which is all about examples around the world that can be drawn on. He calls it practical utopias. But for instance, the Mondragon system is analyzed and what's going on in the, in the French Canadian parts, of, there's very interesting complex things going on in, in Quebec. And he he's goes through model after model after model, which can be drawn upon. So there's a whole lot of, you know, if the academy began looking at this stuff as the way engineers think about things. How could we do it if we wanted to, rather than how we, you know, run the numbers and criticize it. There's a lot of work that could be done. Of course, you have to reform the academy. <laughs> it's, I'm, uh, I know about the economics departments. I fled the country. <laughs> Sir. You've seen movements come up and then, 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 then the repression hits, strong arm tactics and then everything seems to just dissipate. So trying to get young people and people of all different, of, of, of the class, building a class consciousness um, seems in this state of prehistory and the militarism of, of this country. Well, I, I think that the, I mean, the message that this is, the argument that I'm making is that's going to happen, more or less. Uh, we ought to be smart about not creating situations that where it's stupid to do it. That's a whole other tactical set of questions about the way the movements ought to move. There's an internal fight about what makes sense and doesn't make sense in terms of movement tactics. But my suggestion is that, that we've got to walk on two legs, the Chinese expression. And we haven't been. There's been a lot of movement activity and protests. You need to build a movement. And the question is, what is the content of what we want? And the content has not been spelled out. And I'm suggesting, and this book argues, that the content is a radically decentralized system that changes who owns wealth, and that we want to go forward to build that. Now, that's contentful. It isn't only protestful. And I think if that positive element begins to take force, it will begin to give its own motion because we will be demonstrating a different way forward. That doesn't solve the problem you're identifying. But I think it's also, you know, when is it smart to have a, a tactic of confrontation? When isn't smart? There's a lot of tactical questions involved in, in movement building. So I haven't answered your question, but the thrust of where I would go is to build, you know, a lot of people say, what are we going to do now? We're going to build a movement. That, and, and, and a lot of liberals are saying that as well as radicals. 
And what is the direction? Where is it we want to go is not up in front. It's mostly protest and stop. We've got to do protest and stop. But my suggestion is when we get contentful and begin to clarify what the hell we really want, you really change the system? What's it look like, honey? What's it look like? And why should I go if I don't know? We have answers. And we can build those answers and we can communicate them if they make sense. And if they don't make sense, we shouldn't do it. In other words, if we build out clarity about where we want to go really, we ought to be able to communicate that because it's better. And we haven't done that work. We've only begun, and what all I've described is elements, good elements, but they're building. So the question of violence and tactics, I think, is part and parcel of whether or not we have a real clarity about direction. We may have a dis longer discussion about that. Yes? So um, this is a question about projecting into the future. Let's say you see a movement rising, and you are building a political platform to support this movement for radical decentralization of the economy, and you're birthing this new way forward. What are your what are your top three or four planks? What are you going to put out there? On you know for your yeah, I'm not birthing. I'm report. I'm just reporting the news. <laughs> okay, well, one thing you said was I am in, Yeah, I think I believe the elements of a potential systemic design are beginning to accumulate and suggest themselves. Some of it starts with radical decentralization of production and service co-ops, worker-owned firms, uh, neighborhood corporations, and then banking systems that support and nurture that, and the use of public and quasi-public money through anchor institutions to help stabilize that, and then larger forms of that, like the, someone pointed out the New Deal, larger forms of that over time. I think that's a direction that you can begin to say. The banks, the big banks, at some point, right? The, the current demand is break them up. I think the next demand is, is make them into public utilities. But that's, a, you know, when I say the next demand, that's the down the decade, the next decade, and from my point of view. Use of public procurement to help stabilize companies. Mass transit, another element, to begin building the infrastructure and the skeleton of a different economy and, and different form, different institutional form. So, um, you know, kind of the book is filled with this, and it suggests. Where I think this goes in terms of design, these are elements. So let, let me be clear. So far, I'm talking about elements. In, even, even Mondragon is an element. It's not a system. It's a bunch of co-ops. It's not a system. It's not a, a, con a country, a plan, and so forth. Where I think the starting place is, is, is ask yourself this. Airplane, the airplanes always land in one particular community. No airplane stays in the sky forever. So the question is what the communities are like. Any system design's got to hit the ground at community level. What does the community look like that you would want to live in? And, and in terms of the design and land use and all the things we've talked about, you can begin to sketch out a pretty interesting model, a mosaic of elements that begins to suggest what a healthy community might build up from. And then the next question is, you know, the airplane's got to land and ask what, what will happen at this community? And do we want that? And then the question is, what's the infrastructure above that that would help stabilize that community and nurture it? And only go, you know, what the Catholic Church has, the line of subsidiarity is the term they use. And it's a simple term, but it's a very important term. Only going to the higher level when necessary. Whatever can be done to make work locally. And I've sketched a lot of things that are already being done that could be built upon around the country. Then what does it take at the next level? That's beginning to be systemic design, including the banking system, including the procurement systems. That's systemic design if you start there. Now, nobody's done that work, and it's part of the work the academics ought to be doing. But I think the starting place is ask what this community should look like if it were healthy in the richest economy of the world, and then build up. That's how I would go about it. Uh, sir, and then there. I think we're probably getting, and then there. Should we take three more? And I, I, you've got, You're tired of hearing me. <laughs> sir. piggybacking on the gentleman behind you, the question about, which, you know, in terms of the dark side versus the, the lighter side of these technologies, they seem to be, I mean, they are here, and they are they continue to evolve. Where, where might they fit into a more humane uh, arrangement? Not that you have a crystal ball, but if, if 
they are here and they are increasingly refined. He talks about technological unemployment and the displacement of workers and so what? forth. Wait, how could we use these devices in a human fashion? It's, it's a really good question, but let me, here's how I come at that. It's an extraordinary possibility. So he, here's the numbers. In the 20th century, standard technologies advanced such that GDP per capita, capita, per capita increased sevenfold. That's technological change. Because of technological change in this past century, sevenfold increase in the amount of goods and services per person. Unbelievable. And we are at $200,000 per family of four. If the 20th century trend were to continue, and there is accelerating technological change, but if it only continued at the rate of the 20th century, this economy, leaving aside the resource, resource limits, and we could get to that, would be producing a million dollars for every family of four without inflation. Inflation, the number would be higher. Or, a, you know, 500,000 for every family and a 20 hour week, or 250,000 and a 10 hour week. The technology, as Keynes and Marx kept pointing out, is the wonderful boon. It, it opens the way to, you know, really the utopian possibility. So, yes, for the technology. The question is who controls the action? Yes. If you use it properly, it is a wonderful thing. If you don't, unemployed people here and trillionaires there. So, I mean, that's part of the crisis as well. I think that's a, at the level, we've been talking about, as, as, the academy, as the academy would say, we've been talking mainly about material conditions. But in the realm of ideas, the growing awareness of the enormous possibilities of our technological bounty and the misery of the people is a contradiction of an enormous kinds and I think likely to grow and ought to be exploited and, you know, for political reasons. This is crazy that these guys are running off with all the loot and, and people are suffering. The technology is bountiful. So there are moral and idea aspects. I've been talking about material structure, but there's a whole level, and Gramsci was into, into this as well, how do we crack through the, the hegemonic idea systems. But I think there's a set of contradictions going on at the level of ideas. Some of that's discussed in the book as well, but this, we only have time for a little bit. So the, uh, there were two other people, and then we probably should stop. Yes, sir. I've been very disappointed by the uh, labor unions to uh, endorse the uh, Keystone XL pipeline, for example. And here in the Northwest, we're trying to stop the coal export terminals. The uh, labor unions are uh, supporting those as well. And going back to 2003, I recall uh, the absence of the labor unions trying to uh, oppose the war in Iraq. In fact, I asked one of the machinists from Boeing who did show up, and he said, well, the trouble is we can't get our, uh, our union to uh, oppose the war because we're a cross-section. And some are for the war and some are against the war. So for these reasons, I'm skeptical that uh, the marketization of ownership of, the, of production will be helpful in the things that I care the most about, which is the environment, nuclear, uh, Armageddon, and uh, you know, the, uh, these sorts of things. Well, it's, it's a very good question, and, 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 and I would answer it this way. Uh, if democratization of ownership is a necessary but not sufficient condition, but it is necessary to have an institutional base so the question is whether or not people who are getting into this begin to do it with a different cultural vision. So the green, for instance, all the stuff I talked about in Cleveland is, is green, you know, lead gold, building for the laundry, et cetera, et cetera. So the organizers who have a different consciousness this time around are not the guys who organize those unions. There's a whole different culture that's growing up. And, and it has to get intentional. I would agree, agree with you. Just to do it doesn't get us, doesn't get us where we need to go. Uh, thank you for that question. There was one here, sir. Thank you. It occurred to me, I've been reading Gandhi, and what you've been doing is proposing constructive movement in Gandhi's terms, which are as crucial as nonviolent opposition, non cooperation. So thank you for that. I think that's Good. essential. My question is um, do you think that people who are progressive on the left or anywhere should be talking about? their view of what actually happened on September 11th? I, don't, I think it's a non-starter at this point. I, 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 just, I, I don't think we should spend a lot more energy on that issue at this point, because I think it's not going to get us very far. But I, I respect people who, dis, who disagree about that. So we could talk about it afterward. It would take us to a different level. Sir? Then could I throw in one other question? Sure. You didn't speak about global 
I have a pretty hard line on this question, so let me tell you what it is. I don't think you can deal with global warming until you change the system. And I think that, and I'm, I think people who say that there's an urgency argument about if we don't do it tomorrow, it's all over. And what I find that sort of disempowers people because it doesn't happen tomorrow. So I think that it is a fundamental result of the system that you can't regulate. I would like to regulate it. And in the old days, maybe we could have regulated when there was a different power base. But I think these are, that's a system changing issue that really is, is very hard. And we're going to go through a lot, lots and lots of pain before we get to the end of that one. So uh, I have a, other people disagree about that. I'm, I, I think the urgent, it is very urgent, but there is a way of casting the urgency argument that is disempowering. And there's a way of casting it that's empowering. So, but I, th I think that is, it's very systemic. I don't think you can regulate the corporations given the power structure. I think the conservatives were right. The, the, the conservatives I mentioned were right about that. So uh, I'm going to give you a, a website, and then I'm going to sit and say one other thing, and then I'm going to sit down. Okay. So the website that is C um, Community Dash Wealth. Put the dash in because there's one without a dash. Dot org, and it's a website that covers this kind of stuff. Uh, in different, it, and it, it's not only the website, but it points you to other, if you want to know about land trust, it'll lead you to the best land, land trust website. You want to know about worker co-ops, it'll, it'll lead you to the best places that we've been able to discover. And it's, it's either com, com or org, community-wealth.org or .com. So that's one. And I should have said at the beginning that, that uh, I mentioned that I'm from Wisconsin, but I have to tell you a story which is uh, kind of a, maybe apocryphal. Uh, I was, I was uh, in Wisconsin in the 1950s. Do you remember Joe McCarthy? You probably remember that name. Well, Joe McCarthy in Wisconsin was 10 times as bad. And they, they shot anything that moved politically. So if you lived in Wisconsin in the 1950s, and I'm not suggesting this as a dramatic way of thinking about it, but take this down 10 levels. What you knew for sure was that nothing could ever change. It was overwhelmingly impossible to believe anything positive and progressive could happen. And then the 60s occurred. So the point of the story is not to predict the explosion, but to say it is very, very tricky to, discuss, to, to look at what the press mostly communicates and the television mostly communicates as reality to believe what's going on. There may well be, and sometimes not, things that are much deeper going on. And partly, the, I wrote this book with a view to kind of suggesting that, in fact, there's a lot more going on that, that nobody's covering that has very interesting implications if we got serious about it. So thank you very much.